Good morning from Vietnam, Jocelyn. Thanks a lot for spending your evening joining our inside sharing and share your stories with our global audience. And on behalf of the listeners around the world, thank you. Thank you for having me. And you've been in Southeast Asia. You've been to Thailand and to Laos, but you've been yet been to Vietnam. So please accept our invitation. So next time, if you and your, fa your family ever decided to travel to this part of the world, please let us know, and we'll make sure we'll be in town to take you around. Okay? Thank you. I will. And in our culture, it's it's a great honor if we can have you to do a little introduction about who you are and the work that you are doing. Could you please do that for our audience, please? Sure. <clears throat> so I am uh, a uh, formerly the head of research and development at a um, pretty well-known leadership development firm, consultancy, here in the U.S. called the Forum Corporation. And Forum was actually a global um, uh, corporate training and learning company. Uh, we had offices and all over the world. We did did quite a bit of work in Southeast Asia and in Vietnam. Oh. Um, and uh, that was Forum existed from the 1970s up to uh, 20, 2016, 2017. And uh, it is no more, alas, it was absorbed into a into a larger company. But um, my time there was between uh, 1989 and 2013. And I started out as a copy editor, so I was a, a very, uh, you know, a, a lowly editor. And um, over the years, I stayed at the company and worked my way up, and eventually I became the head of R&D. Wow. Um, so I was responsible for designing, uh, or my team was responsible for designing and developing the uh, products that we sold to our clients, which were essentially uh, learning curricula workshops and both in person and online uh, helping people learn how to be better leaders and better salespeople. Uh, so that was my really my whole career um, in the as an employee uh, but in 2013 I left the company and uh, went out on my own. Um, I had written a book my first book with with the company with forum a book called strategic speed and um, uh, so when I left, I thought, okay, I'm going to be an independent consultant, but I'm also going to write another book mm. to try to support my, my business. So um, I had, I had a, a dream, as you, as you have uh, mentioned, I'll tell you about more later what that dream was, but the dream was to write this certain type of book, and so I, so I did that. Uh, and I discovered that I really enjoyed writing books a lot more than being a consultant. Uh. So uh, after that book came out, I decided, okay, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to be an author. Uh, so that's what I've done ever since. So for the past oh, eight years or so, I have been a full-time writer, and I now have five books out. My most recent one that I'm sure we'll talk about uh, just came out in March. Um, and yeah, here I am. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico beautiful part of the world. Uh, my husband is now retired, but was a college professor. And um, yeah, here we are in Santa Fe. <laughs> Jocelyn, you have a phenomenal career journey and a lot of accomplishment that you introduced to us. As I count in my, uh, my watch is less than three minutes. That's not fair for our audience to understand. So let's dive in <laughs> deeper, shall we? Sure. All right. Uh, let's travel time. Let's travel time to figure out how you know everything started. So when I was young, I wanted to become an astronaut, and going to different planets seemed so cool. But life didn't give me any chance to do anything close to what I wanted to be. So I want to know what the young girl Jocelyn, what what was her dream about the future self? Can you share with us? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Well, um, my, my dream from a very little, little girl was to be a writer, actually. Oh. So as it turns out, I am, I am now living the dream. But um, I did not, uh, I, I did, I, that, that was when I was quite young. And as I got a little bit older, 
my next dream was to be a dancer. Um, I wanted to be a ballet dancer, <clears throat> and I pursued that quite seriously for for some time up until uh, really into my to my late teens. I had hopes of of perhaps being a professional ballet dancer, but um, as as I'm sure you know, that is a you know a any type of life where you're devoted to the, the arts. Um, it, it's just um, you have to have absolute commitment. I mean, there, there would have been no college, there would have been no other job, I would have had to just commit to that. And I wasn't willing to, in the end, I, I wanted to go to college and I wanted to, um, you know, um, explore the world and explore other things. And so I, I gave up the idea of being a dancer, um, went to college, I went to uh, Swarthmore College, which is a um, liberal arts college outside of Philadelphia. Um, continued to dance you know, ah. as a hobby, but uh, so I didn't totally give it up, but I, I knew I wasn't going to be a professional dancer. Um, and at college, I found my way into uh, philosophy. Mm. So I was a philosophy major, um, which was prompted by a wonderful professor that um, uh, that was at, who was at, Swar at Swarthmore, and uh, he just um, was such a wonderful teacher and inspired me and many other people to be philosophy majors. Um, so I majored in philosophy, minored in English literature, uh, and then <clears throat> went on after college to graduate school thinking that I would get a PhD in philosophy. Um, so I went to the University of Pittsburgh, which had at the time still has one of the top philosophy programs, uh, doctoral programs in the country. Uh, and I was there for two years, um, met a guy there, uh, my husband, husband-to-be, and we both decided together, we were both in the same PhD program, but we both decided at the same time that this was not for us. We did not, we didn't want to do that. Uh, so we both left together, went out to Los Angeles and kind of hung around in L.A. for a while. Um, and uh, Matt, my, my, who wasn't yet my husband, but was, soon would be, um, he decided to um, eventually to go back into and pursue his Ph.D. Um, in political theory. Um, I decided not to do that, uh, didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I just figured, well, I'll just, um, I, in, when, when we were in Los Angeles, I'd gotten a job as a copy editor um, because I was an English, but I, you know, I had a minor in English literature. Or I was, you know, this is some, something that I could do. So I, I had a, a job as a copy editor in, in L.A. Um, but then Matt decided he was going to continue to pursue his Ph.D. He applied to Boston College, got into their political theory program, and so we moved to across the country again, moved to Boston, got married. Um, he was in his PhD program and I, uh, again, needed a job. So I got a job, I found a job just by chance as a copy editor at this company called the Forum Corporation. Uh, no particular no interest whatsoever and in, I mean I didn't even know what they did. I remember going in for the, my interview and I was I was totally unprepared. I was just like, you know, okay, here's this job. It, it was in, you know, a classified ad. This was back in, you know, 1989. Still you look in the paper for a job, right? Um, and so there was the classified ad saying, you know, we need an editor. Um, I didn't even think I was qualified necessarily, but Matt said, "No, no, you should apply. You should apply. You know, yeah, go do it." So I applied, I got an interview, I went to the interview, I was late, I was, you know, like, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a disaster. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find the place, I was sweating, I was, and then I got there and I was like, okay, well, what, what does this company do anyway? And the, um, uh, the HR manager who was interviewing me, she said, oh, yes, a forum corporation, so we are a uh, consulting, research, and training company. So we do consulting, research, and training, and that didn't really make sense to me. But I was—I just said, "Okay, um, 
all I knew was that they had this job and I had had some experience as an editor, so all right. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I got the job and I came in on the first day, started as an editor and uh, 25 years later, <laughs> I was, uh, I'd had this whole career at this company, which was a wonderful, wonderful place um, with fabulous leaders and really dedicated to uh, developing their employees. Wow. <clears throat> so I was able to go from editor to up to into product development. I was a consultant for a while in, in Canada because we moved to Canada, Toronto for a little bit. Then we moved out here to Santa Fe because Matt got his job at um, the college out here. And I was able to continue working for for, for the same company, Forum, um, in Boston, but work, working virtually um, with a lot of travel. Um, but but also I was one, one of the first, uh, uh, in that first group of, of consultants that were able to work um, because you know, we had the internet and, and so I was able to work from home um, and work virtually and it was uh, it's funny to me now to see all the um, you know people say oh what are we going to do with this you know virtual workforce and how do we manage you know a virtual team because I did that for a long time you know most of my most of my time I was working from home for and managing and leading a team that was scattered across the, the country. Mm. Um, so uh, so that was that was interesting and fun. Um, but as I say, I ended up finally as the head of research and development um, as on, on the uh, um, executive team, and um, that lasted until things all went went. <laughs> went sideways, which if you're interested in, I can tell you about. But um, but the good news is that I had this fantastic 25-year uh, career at this wonderful company um, that allowed me to just learn and grow. And um, yeah, I just, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> Jocelyn, allow me to bring me you back to the university time when, you know, you, in, you know, by then you have a chance to explore all different kind of majors business marketing sales you know like math uh, and and psychology whatever so you said that one professor was so good that he he inspired you to to, uh, to take place mm -hmm. in the you know philosophy major and mm -hmm. and you, you studied the major you went on and studied a master in that major also so what is that what is that did he do that that inspired you to take that major then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I thought when I went to college that um, that I was going to be a psychology major. Mm. I, I just I had I don't know why I just thought oh psychology that sounds interesting. Um, so I had that idea of being a psychology major. I I took an intro psychology course in my first semester. And then my second semester, I wanted to take another one, um, but the, the schedule was just didn't work out. And so I, I remember um, sitting and looking, and again, this was in the 80s, so the written was on paper, and I was looking at the, the course list um, on paper, and I was like, oh, you know, I was talking to my friend and saying, what am I going to do? I, I didn't, uh, I, I, can't, I can't get into this. Um, psychology course, the schedule doesn't work out, or and, but I need something. And, and my friend said, oh, you know, um, this professor, uh, his name is Richie Schuldenfry, he is a great professor and he, and he teaches philosophy and everybody loves him. And so why, why don't you just take that, mm -hmm. you know, like, because that's at the right time and, you know, you can just try it out. And so I thought, oh, okay, fine. So again, it was just completely random mm. by chance that I took this class, Philosophy 101. Um, but what uh, what did what did Professor Schuldenfrey do? I mean, he um, he was just a, a wonderful teacher who challenged all of us to um, to think 
to really think, not not just to you know think for ourselves the way people say today oh critical thinking i mean he really pressed us to um to to argue for what we believed and back up those arguments oh. um he also introduced us to um to a set of books and and taught us how to read those books so we we read um you know Hobbes and Locke and uh, Plato, of course, and Kant and all these these great philosophers. And I had never had that experience before because, of course, in high school, at least in in the U.S., you don't read that stuff. Mm. Um, so I had never had the experience of reading Plato's Republic. You know, it, and uh, Professor Schuldenfrey was, he, he wasn't just like, okay, we'll read this and memorize it or something. It, it was, you know, read this and really understand what these books are saying to us across thousands of years. Hmm. You know, this, this is somebody who really understands um, in a really deep way uh, these political concepts, these philosophical concepts. And, and so if you really pay attention, you can, you know, elevate yourself to a higher level. Hmm. So it was very inspiring and that um, led me ultimately when I was, after having had this other this 25 year career, I ended up going back to those, um, my love for these great books hmm. and these great thinkers. And the book that I wrote after leaving Forum is called The Greats on Leadership and that was the result of this sort of long suppressed um, vision that I had mm. of being able to use these great thinkers, um, these great thinkers and great authors to teach leadership. Mm. So that book, The Great Sound Leadership, it takes these great um, authors and thinkers of the past, every, everyone from Shakespeare to Plato, Machiavelli, um, this, this particular book, they're all Western um, thinkers, and um, I show how they can help us learn to be better leaders. Wow. So it's interesting because I, I uh, it really was able to bring together the philosophy uh, side of my education with the leadership development um, career that I had, and I put them together in this in this one book. And then and then the, the next book that I did, I um, turned to Eastern uh, philosophers and thinkers, sages. Um, Lao Tzu and um, Confucius and um, the Buddha, um, also some Islamic uh, uh, thinkers. So a whole array of um, of Eastern philosophers is what is who I focus on in the in the book after that, which is called the Art of Quiet Influence. Mm. Um, so my my whole uh, life, in a way, has been a result of of these two very random things. One was just taking that philosophy class because I needed something to finish my schedule. And the other was applying for this, um, this uh, job, this editing job at this company that I had no idea what they did. So the, those two things like <laughs> made my life. See, Jocelyn, uh, in, in our culture, we believe in uh, faith. With, with that mm -hmm. way, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's random, sometimes it's something that already you know, plan, you know, on certain things that happen to our life, right? Like, like, the, like you randomly took the class and then the passion and the inspiration from Professor Ritchie basically paved the way for you to get into deeper into philosophy and later on it becomes the work of your life also. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, imagine if we have so many professors, like there's so many people that are teaching with, you know, with, with passion, with motivation to help people to ignite the, 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 the talent inside of them, right? That would be wonderful for this world. And mm -hmm. uh, let, let's go to the next point that you mentioned, and, and the next randomness, which is, you know, the job at the forum corporation, right? Mm -hmm. And you say that you went there for an interview, not, you know, first late, not knowing the works and not knowing what is that, 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 you know, whether or not you're going to like the job, but you got the job, right? And you got the 25 years uh, from, let's say from an editor, which is somewhere in the lower rung of the ladder, 
work your way mm -hmm. up all the way to the to the uh, head of R&D, which is the executive role for the organization, where you have to compete with a lot of experts in the fields who really spend time, you know, on the consulting business, on the training business, mm -hmm. and being you know, mm -hmm. being skillful in that area. And when you only as an editor, so it means that only the first part of the or you know of the piece. So what was the secret sauce that leading to that successful journey that you had chosen? Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, so really, it was um, one. Well, there were many managers that I had that who were wonderful managers, um, but there was one in particular, um, and this was a company that was as I mentioned, very um, uh, intentionally devoted to helping people learn and grow. Mm. So the founder of the company, uh, a man named John Humphrey, who passed away last year very sadly, but was really a, a giant in the, in the learning industry, in, in the, corporate, the corporate learning industry. John Humphrey founded the company with the intention of making it a, a, a good place for people to learn and grow. Mm. He also founded it <clears throat> with the intention of making it a good place for women to work and to lead. Mm. So he, he was very inspired by his mother, <clears throat> who was a very uh, strong and inspiring woman, apparently. Uh, and so he wanted, he explicitly wanted to make it a company where women could thrive mm. and succeed. So there were many, um, the, the, the corporate learning industry has a lot of women in it anyway. So it's not, it's not surprising that there would be many, um, many women leaders, but, um, but he, John Humphrey made a, really made it part of his mission to help women leaders grow. Again, long before, you know, this was in the 70s and 80s, you know, this was long before anybody was really mm -hmm. paying attention to this stuff. Um, so I was really fortunate to have landed at that company because I had I had many excellent managers, many of whom were women, but then one in particular, um, a woman named Mimi Bennett, who was the um, uh, she she was she was not in my group. I, I was I was an editor. I was in the publications um, group, uh, but. Uh, Mimi was in charge of this um, team. It was called the Tailored Team. Where what what she did is she was in charge of customizing mm. or tailoring the workshops for clients. So we had all these standard standard workshops, standard seminars, and then Mimi uh, would uh, people would call her and say, "Okay, I've got a client, and they want this workshop, but they want it changed. You know, this they want their, you know." their own industry examples in there or they want to combine this piece from another program and so she was in charge of, of doing that and she needed editors oh. to help with that. so uh, some of us the the, the the editors were very important to her to her piece of the business and she was a very um enlightened leader in the sense that she um she, she didn't just sort of come in and, you know, throw work at us and say, okay, here you go. She, she said, okay, we're going to have the tailored team mm. and you, Jocelyn, you're, you're going to be my editor that's going to be on, on this tailored team along with this graphic designer and this, this, uh, this project manager. And we're going to have our, so she pulled together cross functionally people from different parts of the organization and put together this tailored team. So I worked with her on that, and we. Um, she was she was just a great person, a great uh, coach. Um, she she just she just she led very well, and she was also um, she put a lot of trust in. So she 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 wasn't um, she she would just say, okay, Jocelyn, you know, you, you can do this, mm -hmm. and here you go, off you go. You know, she and she wasn't. Um, she wasn't hesitant to give people responsibility. Mm. So I started to work with her and learned a lot from her. And then I actually left the company for a little while because I just I was sort of getting bored and, and went to another consulting firm and um, was an editor there for a while.
but it was awful because it was it was not a good culture. It wasn't a it was just not a good place to work. And so um, Mimi called me up one day after I'd been at this other place for a few months and said, "Hey, Jocelyn, look, I'm I'm starting this new project. I'm I'm now um, going to be in charge of of creating this new sales training program, a new product for us." So she kind of moved into product development. And she said, I need a, I need somebody like I need a an editor slash project manager slash assistant. Like I need a right hand woman. And do you want to do it? It's just it's a it's a contract position. It's not a, a real job. you know. Yeah. And but I was so um, uh, I had such faith in her. Oh. I left this other job, which was, you know, a good, steady job, making decent money, and I left that to come to this much more uncertain, you know, basically a temporary kind of position because I wanted to work with Mimi, mm. and I knew she would look after me, mm. and she did. So I, I got into product development through through her, um, and then she she left the company, but I was. Then sort of on my way to um, uh, being in, in product development. I then uh, my husband Matt got um, a postdoc up in Toronto. I moved to Toronto. We had an office in Toronto. There was another manager there who said, oh, "Okay, Jocelyn, come on in, be a consultant. Yeah, you know, I'll hire you um, to join our the Forum Canada team." And he was a wonderful manager too. So I, I was just. I was very lucky to have um, not only a company that was so um, devoted to people's development, but also these particular managers who believed in me and mm -hmm. were able to teach me everything I needed to know. Wow. Here's the thing also, Jocelyn, the, you chose the leader, but also leaders chose you also. So if, you know, so come back to the point where Mimi first forming the team that doing the project of, you know, tailoring uh, a mm -hmm. project for a client and she chose, you know, she invited you to become, you know, part of the tailoring mm -hmm. team, right? Do you have, do you, what did you do differently among uh, many other editors that the forum has mm -hmm. that she decided to have you into, into her team? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Uh, I um, I never hesitated to take the opportunity that was in front of me, and I never hesitated to do more mm -hmm. than you know. I I never um, I never wanted to sort of um, uh, you know sit and, and and do just the one little thing that had been prescribed to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew I could do more. I knew I had, you know, a very good education. I knew I was smart. Um, so I had no. I mean, I had I had a lot of fears, but I did. I never feared my. I never. I never feared my. Um, that I would get out of my depth if I just, you know, went for it. Mm. Um, so I think Mimi and. Um, Uh, Joe was the, the guy in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I think they saw that I was willing to. I, I wasn't ever going to say, "Oh, I can't," you know, "Oh, I can't do that. I don't know how." Or whatever. I would be like, "Yeah, okay, let's let's try. Let me try. I bet I can figure it out." Um, and so, so, so that combination of me being willing to try, willing to figure it out, willing to say, "Yes, I can. Yes, I will," combined with a culture, company culture that encouraged that. Mm -hmm. You know, that liked it when people said yes I can yes I will that that was the secret sauce beautiful beautiful and there's a lot of people wants to you know be successful in that industry and becoming like you know the head of R and person like you are right so you definitely faced with a lot of challenges along the way to go and you know to get into that executive role so if you can share some good you know tips for people so that they can they can find the inspirations for them to continue study, thriving and succeed. What would that be? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, as I say, my, you know, my 
success, I think I, I attribute to being able to not only see the opportunity that would, that would suit me, mm. but also, and, and, and then not hesitate to, to go for it. Um, but also to, I guess, never lose sight of the importance of um, finding good people to ally with, mm. to, to make alliances with. Um, this was something else that the, this company forum was was good at mm. sort of encouraging um, that kind of collaboration. It was assumed that people were going to collaborate and that collaboration was very important. So even though everybody at the company was very, very smart, it was also always necessary to work with other people and to work with other people well mm. and work with clients well um, and not to be a jerk, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there was just no, there was no way. I mean, in some companies, I think you can be a jerk and, and, and rise just because you're whatever, you're aggressive or you're smart or whatever. But at most companies, and certainly at, at this company, um, you had to be, um, you had to be good at, at work. You had to play well with others. Mm, play well with others. <laughs> you had to play well with others. Beautiful. So I was very aware of that, um, that I needed to, um, I needed to be likable mm. as well as smart. Like it wasn't enough to just be smart. Smart was good, mm. but it's not enough. I, I knew I had to be a person that other people wanted to work with. Because mm. in professional services and in, and in most industries, people don't have to work with you. Mm. You know, everybody, we can, we're all very smart at finding ways around the jerk or the person who is lazy or does, you know, is just no, no fun. You know, we, we, we can find ways around. Yeah. Um, and then before you know it, if you're that sort of person, people are just avoiding you and then you, you know, you don't get put on the projects and you, you know, you're all alone in your smartness. Yeah. Um, so the tip that I, I would have, I guess, is that, you know, yes, you, you, you need to lean in, you need to be good at your job, you need to, you know, do all that good stuff, but, but most of all, you need to, uh, ensure that people want to work with you. Beautiful. You remind me about the book Play Well with Others by uh, Eric Parker. Also, I really enjoy reading that book. And, and thanks for emphasizing the importance of you know having strong collaboration and having the right kind of attitude while working with the people because those around you will become a great source for your success also. All right. Just Lynn, I have two things that I want to congratulate you. Well, let's go first with the book. All right. So I interview over 650 people by now uh, in 60 countries and uh, only a few, I think that less than less than 20 of them got their dream from childhood came true. You know, you, you had a dream of uh, uh, most of them like me, you know, being, you know, have a dream to be an astronaut or so, but life can get them to do anything new, but be close to what they want. And you wanted to become a writer when you were really, really young. And you wrote your first book when you were at the forum, right? So mm -hmm. congratulations on that. And that, that paved you a, a, a different path yeah. to a full-time writer. So tell us about your time at the forum is so busy already leading the team remotely, servicing your clients, creating solutions for the clients, and being able to find time to write the book. What happened back then? Tell us. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in my job as head of R&D, and, and I, I come up through product development, that, that was all about designing and writing uh -huh. uh, workshops. So, And, and the, these were not... Um, People often think, oh, you know, a corporate workshop, that means you did some PowerPoint slides. No, this was like you had to, we did serious research and then we created these very well-designed learning experiences that included, you know, instructor materials and participant materials. And so I was kind of writing mm -hmm. book in a way um, all the way along. But um, 
Forum also had a, had a uh, tradition of putting out books. So the executives often would, you know, like any consulting firm, you know, they always like, they like you to have a book mm-hmm. um, or they like to publish books. Um, so when I uh, joined the leadership team as um, executive vice president R and D, I realized that I was now in the, in, in a position to be the author of, of the next book, of the company's next book. Um, you know, there wasn't anybody in a better position because as the, as the head of research and development, it would naturally be me. Ah. So again, being sort of a, an opportunist, I thought, aha, I, I've always wanted to write a book and by gosh, I'm going to do it. Um, so I had the, you know, I had the resources, I had the, um, the authority, uh, I had the idea to um, the strategic speed, which is about um, the subtitle is mobilize people, accelerate execution. So strategic speed is all about how do you really accelerate execution mm. um, in organizations. And surprise, it turns out it's all about the people, right? It's not about the technology. It's not about the process improvement. It's about the people. So we launched a research project on that. Um, and I, I knew I could write uh, and I wanted to write. Mm. So um, oh, we, we did. We hired a ghostwriter to help us to help our team because I didn't have a lot of time. Yeah. To write a book, so we, we hired somebody to you know sort of move the process along, um, and that worked out well. But again, it was collaborative. We had we had um, a team with researchers and uh, um, this ghostwriter and me, and then our CEO also was um, was helping as well. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a great great experience, and it really it was. Um, it was the result result of me as the little girl saying, "I one day I'm going to write a book." Mm-hmm. And so, so I did. let's let's travel back into that little girl, Jocelyn. When you when when that little girl wanted to write a book, right? What what ideas or what kind of book did you think that she's going to write about? Any ideas? Yeah, no, I did not think I was going to write strategic speed. <laughs> <laughs> No, I thought I, you know, when I was eight years old, I, I, I wrote a, um, a mystery mm. novel because I always loved mysteries like, um, oh, uh, the Secret Seven, and there were these, you know, kids books that I loved that were mystery, you know, little kids solving mysteries. So I wrote my own mm. um, mystery <laughs> novel. Wow. Um, and, <laughs> but then when I when I grew up, I. Uh, I, my, my opportunity was to write a leadership book, basically, uh, because that's that's what I the world you know, that's what I knew. Yeah. That was the world I was in, uh, um, and I was by that time I was a you know a leadership development expert. Yeah. So um, so yeah, but then I did write, I have written as my my fourth book was a historical novel. So I did um, move into fiction at one point. Uh, how. I want to go to the second. Congratulations. This is about going solo. All right. So you work with a lot of executive leaders around the world, you know, in developing their teams and themselves also. Right. And when I interview a lot of executive, the one thing that they always say to me is that they they always wanted to start their own company where because they've been successful running other people's companies. And then, you know, they believe that they can do it. And I always told them that you can always do it, okay? So in 2013, you say that uh, you started your own organization, your own company that has been 10 years by now. Imagine how fast it is. So congratulate for walking the world, working for somebody else and on the world of, you know, of running it by yourself. I know it's scary, scary to a lot of people, but it's a big move. So tell us what happened. What did you give yourself the strength and the courage to walk the path alone? No, no, I, I was, uh, I was fired for insubordination. 
What does that mean? I didn't. I, I was. I was. I was sacked. Oh. I was. Uh, so uh, there was a, a new regime came in oh. at one point. Uh, our company was sold several times, and eventually we ended up with a new um, management mm. structure, and uh, it was a disaster, really. Um, a bunch of, I mean, this is this is a very common story, right? You know, you have the new regime comes in, and the and then the um, they clean house basically. Uh, they get rid of the, um, uh, you know, this this the people at the top are the first to go. Oh. Uh, and I was um, uh, not. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the nice way to say it is that I was. Uh, I liked to speak truth to power. Oh. And the not so nice way to say it is that I was just really annoying. <laughs> so I did not, you know, again, I'd always been like used to doing my own thing and moving ahead and saying what I thought. And uh, this did not sit well with the um, with the new powers that that came in. So I ended up getting in this very stupid situation I, I was I was just too, way too outspoken I did not read the situation right didn't understand what was happening um, and uh, got into this big fight with my boss and before I knew it I was on the phone with with HR my boss my boss's boss and they were telling me uh, hmm. bye off you go um, you're being let go for insubordination, oh. insubordinate. And I thought at the time, and it was it was devastating. It was it was a very very difficult time for me. And also, after I left, they like threatened to uh, threatened me with a lawsuit, and it was and I got no severance. It was it was horrible. Um, so, uh, so it wasn't up to me. It wasn't me being being you know bravely going out on my own. It was that I was I was kicked out. Um, but the the funny thing is that here I am years later with with this book <laughs> insubordinate because at that time I I thought to myself you know what one day if I get through this. I'm going to write a book and I'm going to call it insubordinate. Wow. And so here's the book. 10 years, Ten years later. 10 years, Ten years later. later. So I, wrote, I had these other books in between, but then this is, this is the book that really came out of that experience. Tell us about that book. Tell us about the, the, the experience that you were carrying for 10 years until it's published. So, yes. Um, so the, the the subtitle is is twelve new archetypes for women who lead, mm. and again this is a um, uh, this is a uh, what what I la like to do um, in my books is to bring in history and philosophy and stories and legends of the past mm. and combine them with um, research and practical examples and tips from today. Oh. So all of my books really are, are, are like that because remember I've got that philosophy and literature background yeah. and I combine that with the leader, leadership, um, contemporary, you know, modern stuff. So this book, uh, Insubordinate, is about um, women's leadership archetypes. Um, and th so those are things like um, the Amazon, the witch, the snow queen, the temptress, the empress. Uh, so there are these these um, archetypes, or um, they, they have been been used as stereotypes mm. or negative labels for women for centuries. And what I do in this book is I say we can we can reclaim these labels. Oh. These archetypes and learn from them and appreciate them and see how we as women or men can take inspiration from these um, legendary women uh, you know who fit these archetypes 
So I tell stories of, of, of legendary women from the past, uh, from, from all around the world, different cultures, um, and I tell their stories. And then I combine them with real life women mm -hmm. um, who fit these archetypes. So there's, so for example, there's a, in the, in, for the Amazon chapter, there's a, a Greek, um, story of a Greek uh, woman named Lysistrata. So I tell her story. She was an Amazon. And, but then there's also a present day Amazon who was a woman that I knew in real life um, at Forum, actually. Uh, and she was sort of the real life Amazon. And so it, the whole book is about learning from these different um, types of, of strong women and seeing the whole range of you know, what women can be and what women can do and how women can lead. Mm. Um, and it's called insubordinate because um, I, my claim is that women are naturally insubordinate. You know, we, we, we are sort of natural rebels and, um, you know, we don't like to be put into little boxes or fit into sort of hierarchies. Uh. Um, you know, men are often more comfortable in, in a hierarchy, ah. um, and, and women aren't so comfortable in, in hierarchies. So, you know, we like to really be free. Um, so the title insubordinate comes from my own um, experience of being called insubordinate, um, but also um, saying that, you know, we, we as women can be constructively insubordinate. Hmm. Um, and be free of some of these um, these negative labels and, and expectations that are put on us. Um, so we can we can be insubordinate in a good way, and, and this book shows shows us how. If you can pick one chapter in the book that you really really like to share with us now, what would that chapter be, Josie? Josie? Oh goodness, um, I, you know there. Sorry for not being there, fair to ask it, only one specific one. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're all they're all. There's 12 chapters, 12 of archetypes. Um, here's the. Uh, I'll show you the. So there's an archetypes wheel. I don't know if you can see. I can see. Yes. It has. See. Can you see? It has 12. Temptress, witch, uh, Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Clement. Yeah. Mama yeah. bear, amiga, mesmeris, empath. Escapist and yeah. Snow Queen, right? Empress. Yeah. And Chester. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and it's uh, four four elements. So, uh, fire, earth, water, air is mm -hmm. how I organize them. Mm -hmm. So, I, I guess the one that I would point to as my favorite is the Snow Queen. Snow Queen. Because that's me. Ah. I'm, I'm the Snow Queen. <laughs> what is a Snow Queen is? So the Snow Queen is, um, she is up there in the in the top quadrant, up there with the air uh -huh. is the, the element that's up there. So the Snow Queen, um, along with the other um, archetypes up there um, in the, with the air, um, with the air element, um, the Snow Queen is very analytic, uh, cool-headed. So the Snow Queen does not get sucked into drama or, you know, so get involved in conflict really. She tends to stay up above. Um, when things heat up, the Snow Queen keeps a cool head. Um, and she can be criticized for being, um, you know, too uh, cold, too removed. Um, not passionate, mm. but her strengths are that she, um, and, and this is what I, I, one of the things I've needed to learn throughout my career is how to lean into those strengths that I have of being analytic, having a cool head, um, being able to stay out of, of drama and conflict and kind of keep an even heel and guide my team with a, you know, with very, very, very cool, very cool way. Um, so that's, that's the Snow Queen. Um, but then one of my other points is in, in this book is that that having that awareness of where you're most comfortable, what your, your archetype is, where, you, where your comfort zone is, 
that doesn't mean that you can't learn from and expand into the other mm. archetypes. So I have um, learned over the years not only how to lean into my Snow Queen archetype, but also how to draw on some of the others. So how to, if necessary, to be more of an Amazon or to be more of a mesmerist or to be mm. more of an empath, etc. Beautiful. So this book is for 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 us to know about our type, our archetype, so that we can adjust and change. But I believe it's also a book that can be written for leaders to understand who they are leading and and, and the type of the people they are leading, right? Exactly. Yes. Mm. Who, who you're leading? Um, who are the people all around you? So some a reader of mine said, "Oh, you know what? I I I read this book. I love it because." I realized my boss is a snow queen, oh. and and she said, and I'm I'm not. I'm more like a claimant. Probably. I'm probably down on the earth mm. side of things. And my boss and I don't really get along. But I realized now, oh, it's because she's a snow queen. Mm. And so having that awareness of yourself and others, and appreciation for how other people are leading, mm. uh, can be very useful. Beautiful, beautiful, Jocelyn. I have. A few a uh, few more questions for our conversation today, and starting with thinking, because you mentioned about thinking a lot during our conversation earlier. All right, mm -hmm. and my wife and I, we are on a, a mission to help people to improve their ability to think, because we believe that every good change happens because how we can <coughs> construct our thinking in the, in the in the good way. So over the years, how have you been? improve your ability to think? Uh, I really believe that <clears throat> that reading books, <laughs> reading good books and taking them seriously uh, and talking about them with other people is is the key. Um, the, the college where my husband um, was a professor is a is a college called St. John's mm. College. They have campuses in Santa Fe and in Annapolis, Maryland. And they're um, the original great books school. Their 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 uh, curriculum is is a great books curriculum, which means that everybody reads uh, actual books, not textbooks. But you know, you start with the Greeks. You start with Homer. <clears throat> and you move on through through the Greeks, the Romans, to the um, through the Middle Ages, and reading you know Thomas Aquinas, and then the Enlightenment, and on. And it's all the, the undergraduate program is all Western thinkers, obviously. But the <clears throat> but the key is that um, you are reading actual books. There's no lecture. Um, and uh, the, the teaching style is all seminar, seminar style. Mm. So everybody, everybody's reading a book together and it's led by the, the professors or tutors and they, and they lead the dialogue mm. about the book. And it's a, I sound like I'm giving an advertisement for St. John's, but really I'm just, I'm, I'm advocating for the reading of great texts mm. Um, and talking about them with like-minded people as a way to improve not only our ability to think, but our ability to think together. Ah, oh, think together. Wow. In collaboration with other with other people. Beautiful, beautiful. I. Uh, the next question is about the future, because it's not fair if we talk about the past, the present, but we're not mentioning about the future. Is there anything that exciting you are working on, Josie? And you want to share with me the audience so that we can cel celebrate with you in advance. Mm -hmm. I do actually. I am organizing a book tour ah. that is not just not just for me. Again, I'm all about the collaboration. So this is a multi-author tour. Uh, we have 15 authors. They're all women, and we are going to five cities. Um, in the U.S. in and this is in September and October. Uh, and the name of the tour is Beyond Lean In. Mm. Beyond Lean In, the women redefining leadership. 
So these are all women authors with, with expertise in some aspect of leadership who have a different take, a new take on, on the topic of leadership and career success. So they're all just these very smart, very interesting women. They all had books out in the past two years. And um, we're going to, uh, to these five cities, to New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., Austin, Texas, and Los Angeles. <clears throat> so I encourage, uh, and one in, in Austin, Texas will be live streamed ah. on, on Facebook. So I encourage all your, your listeners to um, can go to my website and um, find out more about it. It's jocelynrdavis.com and find out about the Beyond Lean In tour. I'm very excited about it. And the one uh, that live on Facebook, is that uh, open to the public or is that like ticket based? It, it, the, the live stream it will be open. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we can you know join from uh, from Asia to join and share and yep. celebrate with you guys. Yep. Congratulations! I saw a very busy schedule that you have been uh, you have in September and October, and you're gonna meet a lot of like my people, and I enjoy you know great people get together because that's not that's why we know amazing things will happen. Uh, I promised my uh, speaking coach. And that I will need to ask bizarre questions every time that I talk to uh, to you to a new speaker. So, Jocelyn, I have two bizarre questions for you. One is going back to 2013. I know it's not the right moment in in your career because a lot of changing the new power to come in. And I was wondering, you know, on the call that you had with the HR, your boss, and your boss's boss. So. Can you name the gender of the three people? Oh, sure. The, the HR, actually, was a, uh, she was a lawyer, uh, I think. Yeah, she, she, she was so an HR she, person, but also a lawyer. Yeah, so that was she. And then the two bosses were men. All righty, all righty. So probably you should write a book about, you know, like uh, how men leaders need to deal with in in, in, in In, what is that? Uh, in subordinates, right? Insubordination. <laughs> Insubordination. <laughs> right, insubordinate women. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because the tendency around the world is still, every, after all emerging acquisition, we see a lot of good leaders being let go because of, you know, whatever it is, yeah. intention, whatever it is. And that yeah. need not to be that way, you know, we can always create a collaborative culture and learn from the past experience, the past success and merging with the new changing can make the yeah. collaboration a lot better. And I don't like to see every change, every news that, you know, M&A and then we see a lot of good people leaving and that's not good for clients, for the employees, for the cultures and for, you know, for yeah. just the society in general. And that's really right. ruined the spirit for a lot of people trying to build good things around, uh, you know, for, for mm -hmm. humanity. Last question is now going back to you again. One of the dreams that you had also was to be a uh, serious dancer, ballet dancer. Mm -hmm. So the bizarre mm -hmm. question that I want to end this conversation today is about, are you still dancing? No. Oh, no. What would make you dance again? <laughs> well, I no, I'm 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 happily not dancing actually because I I now I I watch dance. I go to uh -huh. um, to see dancers, and I do my own little you know I do like like little sort of yoga ballet stretch routine. Mm. But um, but no, I uh, the the interesting thing about that is that I, I was I think when you're very very good at something at a young age it it sort of makes you sad as you get older and of course with dance or with a, with um, a sport as you get older you just you can't do it the way you used to mm. so and people will say oh but you can just do it for fun but the thing is I remember how well I, I used to be able to dance. Mm. And now it's like, you know, if I were to, you know, try to do that again, it would just, it would just make me sad. So I, I prefer to like move on and do things that I can keep doing really well uh, now, that we're, now that I'm old no. <laughs> and then try to sort of revive the, 
you know, my youth, but I, but I do still, um, you know, do my little, my exercises and so on. Jocelyn, remember you are Snow Queen, all right? So you are analytical, <laughs> you are like you said earlier and stuff. My, my, my passion is to ignite the dreams on people that my, they might forget or, or put aside for a long time. So sometimes, yeah. sometimes, you know, have that, have that laugh and dance with Matt. And if you do that, mm. you let me know, and I will be celebrating with a bit of applause from this part of the world. And I hopefully one day I'll be seeing you and Matt in, in the US because we travel there quite often. Or if you guys travel here, let us know also, okay? Very good. Yes, we'll do. Okay, Jocelyn, thanks a lot for being so generous to spend your time with me and sharing your stories. I really love the conversation. I wish you all the best and see you one day soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the the, the tour and be safe. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.